Due to the graphic nature of events at this haunted place, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of violence and adult content that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. It began with a low moan, echoing down the stone hallway. Torches were lit, hallways searched. Lord Gloms questioned the servants to see if there was a guest who had let his passions run too loudly. They knocked on the doors of the bedchambers. Groggy-eyed, hungover nobles poured into the hallway. They groaned and complained. Then they heard the sound. A high-pitched wail. Then a slap hitting flesh and an unholy growl. The noises grew louder a disjointed chorus that seemed to seep from the walls themselves. As Lord, it was Glom's duty to protect those who were in residence. He gathered two of his servants to come with him and began the search. Room to room, rattling door to rattling door, following the screams. The sounds grew louder as the men inched closer to a locked door in a recess of the castle. Lord Glom's eardrum was vibrating. He stopped the servants from following him further. Lord Glom's approached the door. A searing pain shot through him. He inserted the key into the door. And the noises stopped. He pushed on the door gently. Inch by inch, it crept open. The flame of his torch flickered with an unseen breath. Then, something reached, grasped, pulled. His screams joined the rest as the door slammed closed, swelling on its hinges. Welcome to Haunted Places on the Parcast Network. I'm Greg Polson. Every Thursday, I take you to the scariest, eeriest, most haunted, real places on Earth. This week, join me on a supernatural journey to Glom's Castle in Scotland, home to ghosts, fae, and monsters. It's even the site of the murder of a Shakespearean king. To this day, it's haunted. Listen to more episodes of Haunted Places, as well as ParCast's other podcasts, on your favorite podcast directory. We're also on Facebook and Instagram, at ParCast, on Twitter, at ParCast Network, and at ParCast.com. Many of you have asked how you can support Haunted Places. If you enjoy the show, the best way to support us is to leave a five-star review wherever you listen. The history of Glam's castle begins with the death of a king. Malcolm II of Scotland was murdered at his Glam's hunting lodge in 1034, a violation of hospitality so horrible that Shakespeare used it as inspiration for his great Scottish usurper, Macbeth. Set on a lush green estate 12 miles inland from the North Sea, Glam's castle is a majestic sight a vision of red sandstone rising out of the Scottish mist. The castle doesn't look like your typical stone fortress. A series of renovations over hundreds of years has transformed the medieval building into a chateau-like family home. By 1400, the Lyon family, who had ascended to the lordship of Gloms in 1372, began work on what would become a hybrid of castle and manor house. But Glom's is not only known for its unique beauty. If you listen to the legends, the castle is most known for its many hidden rooms. Alexander Lindsay, 4th Earl of Crawford, had always known that sacrifices must be made to get what you want. There were whispers that his mother smothered her own brother in his sleep because she wanted Alexander to become Earl. He told himself it wasn't true, but he wasn't keen to make a mistake that would put him in the same room with his mother and a pillow. 
He and his friends were invited to take advantage of Lord Lyon's hospitality at Castle Glom's after a hunting trip. It was common for nobles to court Alexander's favor. Alexander's rebellion against the king had ended in bloody surrender, but it had been surrender, not death. That made him an impressive figure. Alexander was excited to celebrate his new life, and Glom's was the perfect place to take risks he'd been prevented from taking during the Civil War. The Lyon family seat was known as a place for Scottish nobles to see and be seen, but the activities hidden from the society crowd were by far the most interesting. The nobles would gamble with their holdings and even their titles in secret card games that began when their wives and servants went to bed. Thunder shook the battlements as a servant led Alexander to a colder part of the castle. Down they went on a rickety staircase, barely wide enough for one sober person. And Alexander wasn't sober. There was only the servant's swinging lantern to light the creaking wood beneath their feet. Alexander's vision swam, but not with the usual comforting sway. The darkness gnawed at the light, and his perception flickered along with the lantern's shivering flame. Though the redstone was moist and porous to the touch, he had the strange feeling that something had been burning beneath them for a very long time. He was fighting an urge to run when the servant came to a stop at a small wooden door. The game awaited within. He found solace in the roaring fire and raucous silhouettes of his fellow card players. Four of the most important nobles in the land sat at a small table. There was one chair left empty for Alexander. He sat in it and drew his first hand, placing one of his rings on the table as collateral. They played for hours. Two of their compatriots had gone to bed, cleaned out by Alexander's wit and luck. But that luck turned. As he sat at a card table with nothing in his hand, Alexander felt the cold rush of panic. He'd run out of money several hands ago. Now, a scrap of paper with his title written on it sat in the center of the table. A title his mother had killed for and would kill for again if needed. He could not afford to lose. The rest of the players had begun to place their bets when they heard a rap on the door. Lord Gloms tipsily muttered something about playing till doomsday, no matter what his wife said. Alexander quietly agreed, indicating that he would tell the Lady Gloms' retainer to leave them to their cards. But when he opened the door, there was nobody there. He stepped into the dark hallway and shut the door behind him waiting for his eyes to discern shapes in the blackness. Water dripped on his head. It was colder away from the fire. His knees ached, and there was a stinging pain in his bones that was too sharp to be blamed on the damp castle or the winding journey he took to get here. A figure moved out of the shadows behind the stairs. There wasn't enough light for Alexander to make out the man's features. The showy polish of his clothes suggested he must be some gentry member who had gotten lost. As the figure moved closer, a sliver of pale moonlight fell across the man's face. Alexander realized that the man's clothes were in tatters. Slashes of ruby red flesh peeked through the fabric. Alexander could smell smoke but he saw no heat or light. He asked who the man was. The man told him he went by many names, but Alexander may call him Lucas. He heard laughter. Lucas tilted his head at an unnatural angle, and Alexander tried to disguise his grimace. It would not serve him well to offend someone in this castle. The price could easily be the loss of his head. There is something you want. The man's mouth was closed, but Alexander heard a strange voice echo in his head. There is something you want. He could not deny it. 
there was a need that was gnawing at his skin. He had heard a bell ring in the faraway chapel. One, there is something you want. Two, there is something you want. Three, to never lose again. He had lost his rebellion, lost his money, and was on the verge of losing his title. Now, he felt it was his time to win. Lucas smiled at him, revealing sharp points of iron where teeth should be. Alexander took a step back as unease slithered down his spine. The man extended one clawed hand. The thunder rolled again, and Alexander jumped. The hand came closer to him, glittering like a snake in the moonlight. Alexander blinked. The shimmer was gone. Lucas's weathered hand was ruddy, likely from trying to fight the cold. Alexander took the man's hand. It was only polite. He was not prepared for the burn of his skin. He screamed in pain, but Lucas would not relinquish. The smell of searing flesh filled the cramped room, and Alexander gagged. The thunder rolled again. And Alexander was alone. His knees gave out beneath him, and he felt something shatter. His vision swam, but when he came to, it was only him and the rain. No rending bones or burning flesh. Just a silly noble standing outside a card game with water dripping on his head. Had he been bewitched? The parish priest spoke of demons, and the old wives' tales told of the unseelie, the dangerous fae who bore humanity ill will. But both of these malevolent beings worked in deals, exchanges. If he had been bewitched, and Alexander was not saying he had, for it had been a long night of strong drink, but if he had been bewitched, Lucas was gone and the damage was done. He would have no reason to fear the rest of his game. Reward now, punishment later. He'd escaped seemingly inescapable punishments before, as he was exceedingly clever. Yes, he hoped he had been bewitched. He was quite sure that he had been. Things were about to turn around. Some color returned to his cheeks as he returned to the firelit table. He took up his tankard with a smile. No one commented on his absence. He picked up his cards, and his heart stopped. It was the same lousy losing hand. Whatever had visited him had not given him his unspoken desire. He looked from the cards to the poorly scrawled IOU he'd left on the ale-stained table, but there was nothing for it. He gave in to his fate and showed his cards. The victor looked at them with disinterest before collecting his winnings. Even the dark forces could not have saved Alexander from ruin. He placed his head in his hands, but only seconds later, he felt stiff paper hit his forehead. He looked up, and there was Lord Gloms, still drinking the tankard he'd emptied to celebrate his acquisition of Alexander's title. Alexander picked up the cards the dealer had swatted him with. Were they letting him gamble on credit? His hand was the same as it had been two turns before. Well, that was improbable. He glanced around the room. A pile of notes sat in front of him. He recognized his own writing signing away his title to whomever won the round. An IOU that had not yet been entered into the pot. He had not anticipated that the strange man would give him another chance. Perhaps this was his moment. He kept the title to himself, folding immediately. Cards went around the table again. He didn't want to look. He took the briefest of glances at his hand. It was the same. Alexander leapt from his chair. He ran for the door and it squeaked open for him. There was no figure waiting in the shadows for him this time. He ran up the stairs, two at a time, but the window far above 
never came closer. He missed a step and stumbled. Splinters dug into his skin. His bones ached as they hit each slat of unforgiving wood. He tried to collect himself on the stairs, but something tugged at his legs. He slid back down into the darkness, his entire body screaming with pain. The wooden door swung open, and he flew through it. Cards hit the table again. Now, now, Earl Lindsay, the Lord Glom said to him, sloshing his tankard. You can't escape the blind. Alexander Lindsay had sacrificed everything for the wrong bet. It wasn't a win that he had wished for. It was to never lose again, and he never would. Not if the game never reached its conclusion. Surely a servant would come upon them the next day. The game would be broken up, and his bargain with Lucas would be dissolved. No one came the next morning, or the morning after that, or the morning after that. While the staircase rotted and Alexander's body accrued more scars and bruises from infrequent attempts to flee, the game never stopped. Later, when Lady Lindsay had stopped looking for her son, the Lions did a bit of construction, another renovation for their little castle. One of the rooms of the tower was walled up. It was a matter of hospitality, really. For some reason, the sounds of rain always carried from down below. If you listened close, you could hear it, even in the sunshine. Rain and the shuffling of cards. The legend of Earl Beardy, the medieval noble who was tricked into playing cards till doomsday, has been passed down by occupants of Glom's castle since the 16th century. Some say he was second Lord of Glom's, and some say he was the Earl of Crawford, but we know that he was named Alexander. It is said that Alexander and his friends were playing cards and dice on the Sabbath when a visitor arrived to join the sinful game. When the men agreed that their sport was far more important than the Lord's day, they were doomed to play until the gates of heaven and hell opened wide. The sounds of dice, stamping, and swearing echo from one of Glom's castle's most remote towers to this day. We'll have more from the castle's dark halls after this. It's not a ParCast podcast, but if you like haunted places, I think you might like The Horror of Dolores Roach, a new horror fiction podcast I found. The Horror of Dolores Roach tells a macabre urban legend of murder, betrayal, weed, gentrification, cannibalism, and survival of the fittest. When Dolores Roach returns to her old New York City neighborhood after 16 years in prison, she's stunned by all that's changed. The only person remaining from her previous life is Luis, an old stoner friend who gives her room and board in the basement underneath his dilapidated empanada shop. When the promise of her newfound stability is quickly threatened, Magic Hands Dolores is driven to extremes to survive. The Horror of Dolores Roach stars Daphne Rubin Vega and Bobby Cannavale and is written by Aaron Mark. I think it's a great podcast, but don't take my word for it. Refinery29 says, The Horror of Dolores Roach stands out from the rest. It's totally fictional, but still equally chilling. You can listen to all episodes of The Horror of Dolores Roach now for free, wherever you get your podcasts. I have some exciting news for you. Starting now, you can listen to Haunted Places episodes that are older than six months, completely ad-free, exclusively on Stitcher Premium. We're always looking for ways to improve the listener experience. We found an amazing partner in Stitcher to bring you episodes ad-free six months after they're released. Again, this will only affect episodes that are older than six months. Nothing else will change. We'll still be releasing new Haunted Places episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. For a free month trial, go to stitcherpremium.com slash parcast and use promo code parcast. That's stitcherpremium.com slash parcast and use promo code parcast. 
Now, back to the story. With the history as long as that of Glom's castle, there's going to be a share of ghosts. Bearded phantoms watching children in their beds. A ghostly man in armor patrolling the halls. A ghostly woman walking between the trees. But only one has reserved a seat in the chapel. Janet Douglas, Lady Glom's. The woman so hated by the King of Scotland that he tried her for treason and treachery three separate times. Not only was Janice Douglas the sister of the man who, for so many years, prevented James from the throne, she was also one of the unseely. He was sure of it. Some changeling, a fae masquerading as one of us, a fraction of a human wrapped in an unfathomable fashion. There was a cruel beauty to her. The harsh lines of her face suggested violence. Her beady eyes appeared to glow in low light. And now that she had married his friend, John Lyon, or Lord Gloms, King James V found himself interacting with the wretched woman more often than he'd liked. He'd supped at Castle Gloms in order to receive Lyon's counsel. James had intentionally avoided acknowledging his hostess in any way, which made him feel very kingly. At that dinner, John appeared in the peak of health. But then, overnight it seemed, John developed a sickness. He wasted away under Janet's care. James was enraged, but he knew who killed his dear friend, and he knew that she would pay dearly. All it took was the torture of seven wretched servants. Then, desperate to bring an end to the brutality, the son of his late friend, a 16-year-old boy also named John, finally gave his confession. The boy spoke softly. His voice trembled as he told the king of his mother's crimes. His mother, one Janet Douglas, also known as Lady Gloms, had conspired with her brother to keep James from the throne he deserved. She had summoned ancient forces to help her, knowing that the treasonous help they'd received from the English wouldn't be enough against James's strong and brilliant army. John had helped his mother carry out these terrible deeds, collecting poisonous plants from the woods around Glom's village and helping to brew concoctions of the darkest designs. It was these poisons that she had mixed into her husband's dinner the night of his death. Janet Douglas had hoped to off both John Lyon and the King in one fell swoop. James smiled. Now he had the evidence he needed. Before the trial even began, James ordered men to erect a scaffold so Lady Gloms could get the death she deserved. If she had wanted desperately to commune with the devil, James would announce her arrival in hell by engulfing her body in flames. As expected, she was found guilty of treason. On a gloomy July day, Janet Douglas was brought in front of a bloodthirsty crowd in Scotland's capital city, Edinburgh. Her servants wept as she scaled the wooden stairs. James had kept her in a cloistered cell during the trial, and he had been delighted to learn that she had nearly lost her vision in the gaping darkness. Those black eyes had gone dull, lifeless. She was tied to the stake protruding from a pile of kindling. While it was common to fit a noose around the prisoner's neck so their suffering in the flames could be ended quickly, James wanted worse for her. The executioner lit the kindling. Flames danced higher and higher until they reached her skin. She did not utter a sound as the fire tore through her body. James thought he had won. There were more witches to be purged, more crimes to be avenged. But in this moment, he was secure, knowing that she'd burn. He returned to Glom's castle to dispose of Lyon's affairs. Young John Lyon was in prison and his lands would need to be divvied up among James's allies, for 
safekeeping, shall we say. James wasn't sure what he would do with the boy. He was older than James had been when he ascended the throne. But that wasn't to what was keeping James up as he lay in the master bedroom of Castle Gloms on one rainy night. It was the incessant banging coming from the other side of the room, as if it could sense the king's growing anger becoming unease. The sound stopped. Deciding it was some trick of the tired mind, the king closed his eyes and floated into a restful sleep. Several hours later, he was woken, not by a sound, but a smell. His room was burning. He called for his guards, who came running in from outside his door. The fire suffocated before they could go for water. James blew out all the candles they'd lit to inspect the damage. He sent the guards back to their posts and checked each wick in turn, making sure it wouldn't happen again. He settled into bed, pulling the covers across his chest, resting his head on the pillow and listening to the rain. The darkness seemed to grow deeper, colder. The air was still, empty, waiting. Some part of James's body told him not to breathe. He did anyway, and the fire sprang up again, tall and orange, licking the curtains and trying to climb the walls. It was the same corner, the southern corner. He tried to reassure himself that the fires that consumed Janet Douglas were over the Firth of Forth, far away in Edinburgh. But Edinburgh was due south, Plumes of smoke filled his bedchamber, floating through the small windows and out into the rainy night. Those red-hot tongues were the only source of light in the dark chamber, but James's eyes began to discern a silhouette in front of him. In that southernmost corner stood a woman, all gray, but wreathed in flame. No, she wasn't standing she was tied to a stake. Their eyes locked, and for the first time, James saw there was color in them. Gold, orange, red, smoke, coals, flames. Lady Gloms wanted to burn him right back. Nearly every historian agrees that Janet Douglas was innocent. James's go-to method of political assassination was allegations of conspiracy to poison, a charge that he levied at the Douglases and other rival nobles many, many times. James would never attain his goal of destroying the Douglases completely. He maintained residence in Glom's castle, but he only lived three more years after Janet's death, passing away at the ripe old age of 30. Shortly after, John Lyon, the seventh Lord of Gloms, had all his lands, including Gloms Castle, returned to him. Despite James's best efforts, Janet's line has remained unbroken in the Lyon family, who still occupy Castle Gloms to this day. It seems to please Janet, as she's maintained a ghostly residence in the castle ever since. In 1716, during the visit of James VIII, direct descendant of her tormentor, she was seen silently praying in the castle's chapel. It has been reported that the Lyon family leaves her seat open to this day. What she hopes to ward off, none of them want to know. We'll check in with more descendants of the lions shortly. Now, back to the story. The Lion family has a disturbing history of locking up disabled relatives, from Janet Douglas's daughter, Margaret, whom King James V found locked away and sent to a nunnery, to cousins of Her Majesty Elizabeth II herself. There are many tragic tales of marginalization in such noble families but none inspired as much speculation or as much gossip 
as the so-called Monster of Gloms. The birth and death of Thomas Bowes Lyon, Lord Gloms' firstborn child, are listed on the same day, in 1821. The little boy who shared his father's name was one of the all-too-common victims of a high infant mortality rate in the 19th century. Well, that is if you discount the midwife. She told anyone who would listen that Thomas had been healthy when she left him, which made the announcement of his death the following day very strange, especially given that the baby's father was Lord Gloms, the 11th Earl of Swarthmore. It was rumored that the true Thomas Bowes Lyon, the rightful 12th Earl of Swarthmore, was not the little boy born the following year. The first Thomas, the true Thomas, was somewhere in the castle, locked away because of how he looked imprisoned by a family too ashamed to acknowledge their true heir. When there were events at Gloms, Victorian-era guests secretly made a game of it. Find the hidden room. Find the monster who had been seen on the battlements. The forgotten Thomas was somewhere, the rumors whispered, locked away for his deformity. Knowledge of the truth of the first Thomas's fate was always a dark secret of the Gloms estate. The 11th Earl's third son, Claude Bowes Lyon, was often said to have an ever sad look. If you could even guess the nature of this castle's secret, he once said to a curious gossip, you would get down on your knees and thank God it was not yours. Thomas knew his seasons and his colors. He knew how to read and write. He knew he was seven years old, and he knew that his nanny loved him very much. He hadn't known what it meant when he heard a new pattern of footsteps on the cold stone, ascending the long path to his solitary room for the very first time. He hadn't ever seen a man before, and this man frightened him. The man announced himself as Lord of the House and Thomas's father. His gaze was somewhere between guilt, indifference, and embarrassment. Thomas had never seen anyone look at him, aside from his caretaker, and she'd examined him with nothing but care and concern, maybe pity. Thomas had never been permitted a mirror. He knew that his face was not entirely round, but he had no idea what he looked like. Not really. What he did know along with his numbers, colors, alphabet, and songs, was that there was something different about him. His nanny had said that he had the curse of the changeling, a child of the dangerous Fay. He knew that he was supposed to fear the Fay and, by extension, himself. But he liked being touched by magic. This man, the dreadfully human stand-in for his own true parent, sat down beside him at his small table and just stared. You have no right to this house, the human father said. It was not the sentiment Thomas had expected. He was not one of them, of course. He did not belong. He tried to tell his father that, but his words were cut off by the man's tirade. Thomas was dead. He had no right to the castle, no right to a family. He was a deformed mistake, a punishment from God for their own greed, a potential sign of the lady of the house's infidelity. He would never be like the rest of them. Thomas looked at the angry man quizzically. His father's eyes were as hard as the stone walls he was not Fay, as the nanny suggested. He was a human boy who was born a disappointment. There would be no more visits from the nanny either. He would be left alone, as he should have been in the first place. But he wasn't alone, not entirely. A man brought him food and books every day, but they weren't allowed to speak. Thomas wondered sometimes if he would be punished if he broke this rule. But perhaps his fey nature bound him to such riddles and orders. He had made an agreement with his father that day. 
And the Seelie, the good fairies, always kept their promises. Thomas couldn't contemplate the notion that he'd been a bad fairy. The tales his nanny had told him of the unseelie fae were terrifying. Perhaps his father thought he was one of those. Thomas was determined to prove to him that he was not. But his father never came. Years passed in silence. Sometimes he felt invisible. He'd sing to himself as the steward entered and exited, hoping that he'd find some joy in it. The man never even looked at him. Thomas tried talking, speaking the poems his nanny had read to him. But the steward merely set the supplies down and left, as though the room were empty. He averted his eyes, as if Thomas was a horror. After what may have been months or years, he attacked. The servants screamed and fought, but Thomas had taken him by surprise. His fingers clawed at the man's skin. He screamed with the steward, finding a dark rush of joy. The servant bit his arms. He rammed himself backward into the stone and Thomas fell to the ground. His grip on the man pulled him down with him. Eventually, he woke up on the floor, alone. A cold plate of meats was placed next to the door. He choked them down as best he could. There was no water to sate his thirst. For the first time since the disappearance of his nanny, he laughed. His father could take many things from him, but he refused to starve the boy. For all his allegations that Thomas was dead, his father was keeping him alive. There would always be someone to bring him things. Kindness had not proved itself to be a worthy venture, but violence. Violence held promise. The next day, the same man greeted him, or rather, appeared without greeting, eyes lowered to the floor. Indifference, it seemed now, rather than just horror. The steward's wounds were bandaged, but Thomas could see the bruises on his skin. He liked the proof that someone knew he existed. The man would go down to his supper. He would see Thomas's father in the hallway. Perhaps the steward's wounds would get a second glance. Perhaps his father would know that Thomas wasn't dead. Thomas didn't attack again until the marks had faded. He sharpened his nails into points. When the steward brought in his tray for the day, he dragged his fingernails across his face. The steward dropped the tray and fled. For the first time in his life, the door was open. He could be free. Thomas didn't know what the world looked like, nor even the rest of the castle. But it was his birthright, and he wanted to see what had been kept from him. He followed the man's screams down the stairs and out into the long hallway. There were guests in the house. He could hear them talking to one another, laughing. He was afraid to approach them. He did not know how they would react to a fay such as he. Thomas took in the space around him. The windows were uneven, hung at different heights in a disorienting manner. There was only one window in his room, and it was too high for him to see anything out of. But this casement allowed him to see the fields of green below. He unfocused his eyes, and his face briefly reflected back at him. He quickly averted his gaze, not wanting to risk seeing the reason he was so brutally rejected. As he turned away, he noticed a girl about his age. He stepped toward her. She did not run from him. Instead, she smiled. They exchanged pleasant greetings, and Thomas got to experience something he'd only read about, the comfort of spending time with a peer. She looked at him with a warm fascination, and it briefly filled him with something he did not know to exist. Then the roar of his father ruined his happiness yet again. He dragged Thomas away from the girl and back into his dungeon. 
Thomas tried to fight. He clawed at his father. But the elder man ignored the blood that dripped down his arms as he threw Thomas back into the tiny room. The door locked behind his father's retreating back. Thomas expected to spend the rest of the day alone, but then he heard his father's heavy footsteps echoing up the stairwell. There was a clanking that followed the sound, one that Thomas couldn't place. The door opened, and Thomas came face to face with his father and a younger boy. He had a brother. Thomas was more confused than angry. Hello, he said, his own voice sounding foreign now. In a patient voice that Thomas had never heard his father use, the man encouraged Thomas to put the chains through an iron ring. In spite of himself, Thomas found himself reaching for the chains, but his father pulled them away, handing them to the other boy. The younger boy was rewarded with praise as he completed the task. He looked at the other boy once more and knew it. He was Thomas also. The Thomas his father wanted. His brother clamped the irons around Thomas's wrists. His flesh pinched and reddened where it swelled. Even in his tiny world, he could not be allowed to roam free. The chains, his father told him, were for his own good. He needed to be protected from himself and others. Thomas wanted to attack his father, beat his hands against the man's chest, and rip this room, this castle, apart, piece by piece. This other boy received kindness and patience. He received cold iron and spite. They did not want him to live, but they could not bring themselves to kill him. And somewhere, in the dark part of his heart, he knew why. He knew they were afraid and ashamed. They could beat him, hate him, hurt him, chain him to their stones, but they would not be killers. Because killing for someone's own good was harder to justify. He pulled one last time at the iron that burned his skin, but the chains held. The chains would hold him the rest of his life. It was many years until he saw his brother again. His father had died. Thomas was now the other Thomas's responsibility, and his care would continue as it always had. The new Lord Gloms did not have the courage to kill his brother, but he would not let him live either. Thomas rattled his chains at night, hoping that the sound would carry. Sometimes he could swear that he heard someone new coming up the stairs. But it was only his imagination, his only constant companion in the musty, dark cave that was his home. What Thomas could not know is that someone had hinted at his existence. Full search parties were mounted by guests, hoping to find the secret door that would allow them to marvel at Gloms's largest failure. To those people, he was nothing more than a frightening story. The hidden monster of Gloms that could devour the peerage if he ever got free. And he would. He was the king of the unseelie court, and they were right to fear him, for he was stronger than them all. It is said that as Thomas Bowes Lyon, the 12th Earl of Swarthmore, lay on his deathbed, he asked his brother Claude to come to him. The men spoke behind closed doors, and when Thomas passed, Claude, now the 13th Earl and Lord Gloms, ordered that the chapel at Gloms Castle be restored. He was often seen kneeling at the altar in the morning still wearing the clothes he wore the night before. If the Thomas Bowes Lion, who was born in 1821, did survive, he likely didn't outlive his brother Claude, who passed away in 1904. It's interesting, then, that the New York Sun reported this in the same year. Quote, 
On one occasion, a young doctor who was staying in the castle professionally found on returning to his bedroom that the carpet had been taken up and relayed. By raising the carpet, he laid bare a trap door, which he forced open and found himself in a passage. This passage ended in a cement wall. The cement was still soft, leaving the impress of a finger. The next morning, the doctor received a check for his services, with the intimation that the carriage was ready to take him to the station for the first train." End quote. Glom's castle has always been the kind of place where nobles sweep unpleasant things under the rug or seal them into the walls. Murdered kings, cursed card players, abused relatives, they all disappear into the myriad hallways and corners the castle's storied history has to offer. It's been said that a group of guests to the castle once endeavored to put cloth sticking out of every window, just to see if they could find one of Glom's frequently mentioned hidden rooms. There were several windows without cloth, but no one could find the entrances that connected them. And yet, the great contradiction of the place is that aside from a few relatively brief occupations from King James V, Oliver Cromwell, and the Duke of Cumberland during the Jacobite Rising, there has always been a lion at Glom's castle. That's a remarkable thing for a British fortress, especially in Scotland. Glom's castle also has the distinction of being the childhood home of Her Majesty, the Queen Mother. Her grandfather was the troubled Claude Bowes lion, and the man so many believe was walled up by the lion family was her granduncle. Today, Glom's Castle is a museum, a restaurant, a wedding venue, and a private family home. But if you're lucky enough to receive an invitation, be fussy about where they decide to put you up. As Sir Walter Scott wrote after his stay in 1794, I was conducted to my apartment in a distant part of the building. I must own that when I heard door after door shut after my conductor had retired, I began to consider myself too far from the living and somewhat too near the dead. Thanks for listening to Haunted Places. A new episode comes out every Thursday. Listen to all of ParCast's podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, CastBox, TuneIn, or your favorite podcast directory. Many of you have asked how to help the show, and if you enjoy Haunted Places, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review wherever you listen. We'll see you next week. Haunted Places was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It's produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Kenny Hobbs, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Muller. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Haunted Places is written by Lil DeRitter and Jennifer Richet. I'm Greg Polson.